So as we navigate rapidly evolving landscape of artificial intelligence, uh, this session poses a critical inquiry that resonates with each of us. Is AI destined to be our downfall? With insights from leading experts in the field, we'll explore the potential risk and rewards that AI brings to our society. So without any further delay, let's put our hands together for this session's mediator, Stephen Mora, Vice President of Growth Marketing. Thank you, Ms. Song. Yeah, it's on. We're good. I'm on the next good. panel. You hear me? Yeah, yeah thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yes, hi, I'm Steve Moore, Vice President of Growth Marketing at Balasis Media. Um, we are a B2B AI first global firm. And one of the things that we're going to talk about is the key word here is downfall. And amongst the group, we did have a lot of discussion about that. And is it a downfall or is it not a downfall? Well, we're going to talk about specifically, and one of the things we talk about in our business is that if you have AI, are you using it properly? Has it been developed properly? And in many cases, it has not. There is no regulation at this point, and there's a great deal of work that needs to be done in order to bring it to the forefront. At AI, it went at, I'm sorry, at um, Balasis, what we've done is we've gone to extensive lengths. We have at our company 75 research analysts and data scientists. And what they've done is they've taken AI into a new direction in order for us to be competitive within our industry. Results is it's very good. We're seeing a 10 to 15% conversion rate with new clients, tech companies, manufacturing, variety of different industries globally. But one of the things we want to touch on here is that's great. We are proud of it. We want to do more of it. And we're going to talk to more companies because now we're going to license it. However, I get 15 to 20 emails a day of other companies that have AI. I've looked into it. It's not what any of us ex expect it to be. So if a company takes that on, <laughs> what happens if it doesn't work? What does that do to the rest of us that have developed it properly within the industry? So one of the things we're going to talk about with the panel is we're going to touch on that with the team of, uh, of great experts. If I have the panel here. Okay, so am I going to be solo? You coming, guys? Well, we are, we're getting mic. Do you have a microphone? Oh, I, well, no. Technology. There you go. <laughs> I think we're starting to five. Uh, yeah. yeah, we have a couple. I can't carry this one, but I can speak loud enough. What do I do? Could you see this? Yes, the other thing I'll talk about at our company is, just to fill up some time, is that one of the things that I think is important is that we've built our own database. We've done it from the very beginning, and we'll continue to do it that way. So when we do something, we know about accuracy is key, and we have a significant amount of percentage. We guarantee 92 to 95 percent accuracy on the programs we've developed. We've developed our own modeling of our database persona. And the idea of the combination of that with intent data, our team of stakeholders have basically put together the right NLP to give that machine the right decision making to do what they need to, to, what, to find what it needs to find. The next thing they've done in terms of taking that a step further yeah. is so that the machine goes off and asks more questions on its own. If you have the right stakeholders from the beginning, and the right layers are being placed in there, you're going to get the results that you need. So our strength in the industry is the fact that we've built our own database. Other companies that we've seen and worked with, they've outsourced it. Clients come back to us and said, they told us it's going to work, but it's not. There's another problem. So while AI is great in where we're going, again, if it's not done properly from the beginning, it can hurt all of us. So that's something we will we'll touch on with the panel as well. Did we get a microphone? 
change. <laughs> Maybe not. We can talk loud. Can we take this as a spare and thank you, sir. That's a good sound. Sorry, we didn't meet him before. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Um, yeah, so are you going to yeah, leave it at the yeah, table? Yeah, you can leave it at the table. Yeah, I'm going to leave it at the table. Right where the black backpack is. Where are we? Is it here? I've got this just like this. Yeah, let me all slow down. Oh, right on. Oh. We might have to shift down one. We've got more. Oh, I get the grace over here. <laughs> All right, we have a microphone. Yay. Um, so it, I set the stage. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. What I want to do is just go down line here. And it, it, each person obviously introduce themselves, give some more insight. And then we're going to come back. And it, it, I'm excited about this because it was kind of cool. We did have our own Zoom uh, call. And we were just right into it right away as a group. So it's something that we want to bring to the forefront. We also want to save some time because I'd like to make this interactive. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you experience because that's what it's all about. Next. <laughs> to introduce myself. Yes, go ahead. Do, do stuff, what you got, your title, what you're doing. Oh, OK. Kind of uh, my name is Krishna. I'm from CloudRec. Um, we are trying to disrupt uh, IT staffing industry. Uh, yeah, so I'm from CloudRec. We are trying to disrupt IT staff in the industry. We're trying to um, leverage AI um, and uh, do a lot of interesting stuff, which we will discuss as we progress this conversation. Um, and I'm glad to be here and you know, open to more ideas from the panel. Great, thank you, Hunt. Uh, Sandra Lewis, currently work for Accenture, been in the industry for just over 20 years. Um, I am an AI, ML, IAM, et cetera, et cetera, specialist. Um, I would have loved to have been on the previous panel. They talk about a lot of the stuff that I talk about, but they said, come and talk about AI, um, which I will do with the other great panelists here today. Hi, uh, I am Arvind Kothari. I run a boutique uh, investment and advisory office uh, out of Bay Area. It's called Quest. Uh, we work with startups, small businesses, and nonprofits. Uh, sector agnostic uh, engagements vary from advisory and fractional positions to early stage investments in startups, uh, as well as high value introductions. Happy to be here, and uh, I hope this uh, conversation is going to be uh, as insightful for you guys as it is going to be. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Luca Ceccarelli, and I'm the founder of AI Synergy Leadership, and where we are navigating the crossroads of education, AI, and resilience by facilitating AI literacy and leadership for students um, and educators and parents, guardians, for the betterment of humanity. So let's go back to that word downfall. Is it? I'm going to keep both feet in one realm each. Yes <laughs> and no. <laughs> OK. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. And I think from what we've heard on a lot of the other panels, I think it's probably something that's been discussed the entire time is yeah. some people agree that AI is a good thing and then sometimes it'll be a bad thing. It just depends on where you're coming from. Now, with my cybersecurity background, I would say the downfall would be the people. And we've heard this the entire time throughout this conference is that the weakest link is our people. And part of that downfall is also when it comes to AI is the mindset. Um, and we've also previously discussed this as well. Um, if you don't have a healthy mind and you're putting someone in the space of AI to do that work, then you may not get the outcomes that you're looking for. 
So this is, again, what you and I, Stephen, had discussed previously in our call, mm -hmm. is that you have to ensure your people are you know, healthy of mind mm -hmm. to do what you need to do. And also that sets into the programming of the AI and, you know, all the learning mechanisms. Because if we're not teaching it to do the proper things, mm -hmm. we will not get the proper outputs. Mm -hmm. How do you get the right people? That's the hard part, right? right? Because right. again, we're talking people are our weakest link, right? right? So again, through, we've had HR specialists. They're also using AI to do their you know, hiring. Right. So again, what are the parameters that are being used to do that hiring? Do you think age makes a difference? Well, I'm going to say no. Okay. No, I'm just, you know, because college age, you know, it's senior. Hey, it you know what? I do a lot of mentoring okay. of college and university students. Right. And again, I think humans need to be at the basis of all of it. That's our baseline. Exactly. We are our baseline. Right. Right. So we being older will teach the younger generations of what that baseline is. So when they come in and they bring AI, they know where their baseline is right. to start building up. And we heard that in multiple panels. Right. You have to have a healthy baseline. And I think people are at the forefront, humans are at the forefront of that healthy baseline, right? Thoughts? Uh, I think AI has more positives. I'm, I'm more optimistic. Um, I don't think uh, this is going to lead to any downfall. Um, I think as long as we can um, put proper governance, and I think uh, regulation is one other area, which I think um, yeah. are important, uh, going back to the human element uh, at the end of the day, um, what are you using for, what is your intention, what are your moral ethical values around that? Um, and um, you could use to bring a lot of efficiency in any any kind of environment, um, whether it is marketing, you know, sales, um, building a company or, or research. Um, uh, actually speaking, everybody will become more efficient, but at the same time, uh, it would also put a lot of folks who are not so efficient um, behind because uh, it'll bring a lot of transparency. It will also bring a lot of um, speed. Uh, uh, I think it will also bring new money to the economy because you'll find more innovations, more entrepreneurs bringing uh, new ideas, which means new businesses, which means new capital. Um, but at the same time, uh, your intent uh, and purpose has everything to do where it goes. Uh, well, you, you mentioned something that we talked a lot about, a big, big concern of mine, as I mentioned there. Yeah. Regulation. Regulation, mm -hmm. yeah. There is no regulation. Yeah. Right? And I'm sorry to say, but if we wait for the government to do it, I will be dead. <laughs> it's it, it, So, you know, I mean, regulation, thoughts? Uh, I think on the regulation side, um, there are these approaches where we talk about companies self-regulating themselves in absence of a top-down approach to regulation. But uh, we need to be a little bit careful about it. The, the idea should be to look at uh, what industries uh, have implemented self-regulation well and what are the learnings from there. Uh, and also where self-regulation hasn't given us the type of outcomes uh, you know, that we want. Uh, example outside of the AI domain is Boeing. Uh, you know, FAA and NTSB type of organizations are so underfunded, they depend on organizations like Boeing to self-regulate themselves. And yet, uh, we have seen the type of things that have happened in the recent past. So what are the learnings from there? And uh, it is for the organizations and the companies uh, who are engaged in AI research and building the infrastructure and the apps on top of it, uh, to take those learnings. Uh, at the same time, about the top-down regulation, I think fundamentally we have to stop looking at or modeling regulation as something that is going to necessarily uh, stifle innovation in this field and also in general. I think this idea that it is necessarily going to be a headwind kind of puts off uh, a lot of things. 
uh, I think we have to look at regulation also as a kind of innovation because the speed of development in AI field is also going to be, it is already quite fast. Right. So, uh, you know, organizations like Uber engaged in regulatory hacking. What if our policymakers were to, you know, do a symmetric thing and look at technology hacking, for right. example? Right. I don't exactly know what that would entail. What I'm saying is that I think we need regulatory innovation as well. Uh, both on the organization side, the non-governmental side, as well as on the government side, to keep up with the pace and to ensure that there is uh, no downfall, so to say. Lucas, thoughts? Well, <clears throat> um, I'm currently running a pilot program in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with a, in a high school, um, and, and the program is called Philanthropic AI, and the aim is basically to teach AI literacy and leadership through engaging in a um, impactful project in your local community. So some kids are developing um, events, some are doing philanthropic uh, donations, gathering, others are developing apps. One kid is apparently writing the newest, um, a new kind of database code. Um, so I, I kind of took the question to them, the question of is it gonna be our downfall and I, I got some really interesting results. I wonder, I don't know, by a show of hands, if you might want to hear from some of the students directly. Absolutely. That's perfect. Um, so is AI destined to be our downfall? And I wanted to give another option or our salvation. So they're both equally as dramatic. Um, so Cade says that the impact of AI on humanity's future depends largely on how it's developed, deployed, and regulated. Uh, it can potentially offer immense benefits, such as improving healthcare and solving problems. Another student says AI is not designated to the, to the downfall of civilization as it matters how people see the content it generates. Deep fakes are the most destructive possibility. Um, another kid says, I personally do not think that it will be either, but if I had to say, I think it would be the downfall just because of the stereotypes and movies uh, about artificial intelligence. <laughs> so I think it's interesting because it's kind of tapping into the zeitgeist here. The last one I'll read, I mean, there's many more I could share, but my biggest fear about AI is that it could harm people through data misinterpretation or data failure. Either of these means that AI does something that it wasn't meant to do because of having no data, data failure, or not understanding the data, the data misinterpretation. So I think these are really kind of profound voices that we're hearing from the kids. Because um, uh, when you look at the... There's a lot of fear mongering, but there's also a lot of shame associated with AI usage right now. So I think that's one of the things we're trying to tackle is what if we take take the shame out of it and, and start a different dialogue with the kids so that it could actually be our uh, a form of salvation. So it could actually help us tackle some of the most challenging problems of our times. Ultimately, what I'm seeing is that these kids are in a state of shock and apathy and completely overwhelmed at a world where against a backdrop of corporate and political and environmental alarm, they are, you know, so ha overwrought with, with fear. Um, so, and I, and I think a lot of us feed into that narrative. So what we're trying to do is, is, is flip that script into one of, hey, how can we use this? Maybe this is the exact tool that we need is to get out of the dilemmas that we're in. What if AI can help us and create a synergistic dynamic? That's a great perspective. I mean, do you find that, 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 they, that they have solutions on their own? Do they have thoughts of what could be done at that age? I'd love to, you know. Uh, would you like to hear more? Sure, sure. Um, so what are your biggest hopes for AI? Sachi says, I hope that it'll be a helping hand. When I say helping hand, I don't want it to be our whole world. I also hope that AI helps improve our education and grow more, uh, to grow more, excuse me. Um, another student says, to help improve healthcare and develop ways to help people and animals. Um, that it could help us in our everyday problems as well as big problems that are happening all around the world. So I think that message is starting to come through that it's there, there is potential here for it to really be very dynamic. Um, a, AI can be the most powerful tools in the history of humanity, says one kid. We are already using AI to generate models of climate patterns that work better than traditional methods a hundred times faster. Or you could use it for a theoretical model of a genetically engineered, a ge engineered bacteria to fight cancer tailored to the genetics of that specific person. I mean, okay. 
let do that. Let me get out of your way and do that. So, you know, coming back to Sandra's yeah. point, I think at a certain point, it's, um, it's the Gen AI natives that are going to teach us these kind of benchmarks. Like, you know, in a sense, we have to jump out of the way uh, and, and provide the safety, the regulation, and the literacy, and ultimately the leadership, so that they can move, they can change things in the world. Do you find that case? I mean, how do you? What do you do when you have a, a group of people that don't really understand it? We teach them. We teach okay, them. Okay, yourself. That's we right. teach them. Right. No, I mean, <laughs> right. But, but coming from, let's say, from Accenture standpoint, is there a group? How do you do it at a corporation? as opposed to what, what what's the key to that teaching okay training training right that's the only way that we do it and it's by connecting with our own people right that we continue to understand this yes. mentality right right but again to luca's point we should also be educating our young people right taking it out of the office and taking it into the schools, right. not only educating the students, but educating the teachers as well. Right. Because I had a wonderful conversation with a group of um, people that are in the education forum yesterday. And part of the conversation went was, kids are using AI to generate their papers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. But here's the caveat to that. They use Grammarly. What is Grammarly? <laughs> AI, right. right? Right. So where's the balance mm. that we're providing, you know, our young students to do their papers and use a tool such as Grammarly and not be penalized right. at the same time for using it? Are they right? learning at that point? And also not right. having double standards because to that point, teachers are using AI to generate the syllabus and the questions and the Correct. answers and right. to do the reviewing. Correct. So at, at what point are we setting double standards that are very confusing? Yeah. And I think this is also an opportunity to rethink some of our old processes. If we feel that using AI in a particular way is not good, let's say for generating research papers, maybe we have to reinvent the process of doing research and communicating it for, for the new age. Right. Uh, you know, uh, again, what are those solutions or what what is that going to look like? I don't know, but like the term Jenny I native, I think some great ideas can come from people who are going to use it more and more, whether we want them uh, to use uh, these tools or not. I think that is where some of these new approaches are going to come. Uh, you know, so let's take this as an opportunity to do away with some of the processes that are no longer relevant in the world today or are not going to be relevant in the near future and, uh, you know, usher in a new way of working. Yeah, but that will also disrupt the existing models and uh, it would also displace a lot of, t I mean, why would I need a teacher to teach me? So in, in some cases, not, not, not in every case, you know. The information is out there. I mean, I, I, I question, I get an answer. I question, I get an answer. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to memorize? That's a concern. That is a concern. Yep. Right. So right. it's it, it's a, it's greater than what we think. It's much bigger problem, or, or or the solution needs to be a lot more broader than just addressing a single issue. Uh, I mean, you we can say you know, teacher is using AI. Your principal is using AI. Your district is using AI. Everybody is using AI, and you're not allowing the kid to use AI. Mm -hmm. So where is the line? Yeah. How, well, how, yeah. how do you analyze intellectual capability of a student at any given point in time when that intellect itself is coming from some other source? See, the thing that I think about as I go back to our company, we have 75 of these analysts. Several of them do come from colleges and universities. And the discussion has been that they've had good teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay. They've had teachers. That, so, you know, we, when, when they go through a vetting process with us, they better know this backwards. And, and, and we, we, we take that right from the beginning. That's been the key to success. Mm -hmm. But you make a good point. We, we, want, we check them and we make sure that they have the right teachers. Do the teachers understand this? Do they, do they know what they're, they're helping them learn? And then my feeling is that, yes, we, we, if they pass that test, now they're on our team 
because we want to make sure because then that provides how we're going to build our company. Mm -hmm. Stakeholders that understand the process come together, mm -hmm. but they've got to be the right stakeholders. Right stakeholders. The concern is, is that when you go back to companies that don't do that. Right. Okay. In our business, we have a lot of third party companies. Mm -hmm. They sell that software. Mm -hmm. And as I said in the beginning, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So they come to us and say, can you do it? Well, yeah, we can. Here's why because we've done it right from the beginning. Right, from the the beginning. concern is no regulation. Mm -hmm. What happens if it's not done right from the beginning? Right. Mm -hmm. it, 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 can, it can be the downfall at that point. But who so, determines what is right and what is wrong? Nobody knows. It, does it go back to the human and our experience? Mm -hmm. Does it go back to as exactly as you just said? And, hope, and, and you got to hope that it's done properly but I still come back to that word regulation. If there's a regulation that I need to bring in the experienced people, then I do that. If there's a regulation that and even on a, on a school level, I have to teach <laughs> the right way, then maybe that's, to me, that no, seems no, we, like it's the good start to take us to the right path. You have to teach the teachers to teach the right thing <laughs> so they produce the right, right students for us to hire. Right. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, well, we could play devil's advocate and just throw a wrench into the whole thing and go, who says that it's right, right? <laughs> right. It, because, again, there is no regulation. There is no right. framework. So who's to say that you, me, anyone else on this stage or anyone out in the audience is doing the right thing, mm -hmm. right? So, again... One foot in one realm, one foot in the right. other realm. Right. And it has to do, I think, with the business that you're in and what the what the out what you want the outcome to be. All right. So if we question what the outcome it is we want to be, I can speak in our business. Our outcome is to get companies new mm -hmm. new clients. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how do we find them? Well, we find them right. because of the, the the things that we put in place. Now with the overlay of the AI, the detection is there. It's higher. One thing that's constant is markets are going to change. In our business, markets are going to change all the time. Actually, in our business, any business. So, but it, so can you predict uh, what the change would be using AI? Yes. So because that, that if is you, the advantage of using AI. Exactly, because the, exactly it, is the, it's the cherry, it's, it, it's, it's the top of it all. Exactly. Because if you, if you bring it to that point properly, then the AI is going to find, again, as I said before, machine learning, now the machine is going to go back and question itself. However, it's got to be the right input from the beginning. That's the concern. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's where I think, it, it, hopefully that's where it needs to go in order to be. Now, the other thing too is I think now when you've taken it to that point, what we are doing is we are going to work with a client, but we're also going to be with them directly. If you're going to license it, we're not going to give it to you, sell it to you. I don't, I don't believe in sales. We, we look at helping companies. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do that and we're going to help them, we're not going to say, okay, call us if you need us. Mm -hmm. No, yep. because then it's the collaborative use of the assets. What the client is looking for, what we've developed, you put the two together. Now you have a success story. Mm -hmm. I still have this thing hanging over my head that says regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because in our business, we have GDPR rules, we have ethics, we have all types of things that we have to take care of and be concerned about, or else there's serious fines as there should be. Yet, what happens to the company that didn't follow that? They sell it and then off it goes. So I think companies have also accumulated uh, enormous cash piles to deal with uh, the fines uh, after the fact instead of regulating themselves. So uh, regulation does seem to be uh, kind of a linchpin here. But I think there are some uh, other things to be considered as well. So what we have discussed until now is using AI or not using AI or using AI for good or bad purposes. But there is also probably a resource view to consider. Uh, for example, in order to prop up the infrastructure for the technology, uh, we are building these big uh, data centers. So mm -hmm. water is required to cool the infrastructure. Uh, electricity is required to power it. And we are also using, uh, uh, you know, silicon for building the infrastructure in the first place. So who is to say what is the right allocation? Because there could be other technologies uh, or even within AI, there could be different approaches. So one is the generative approach, but then there could be other approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the right resource allocation for those type of things? And even on top of that, 
resources like water and electricity are fundamental needs of the society outside of them being uh, allocated for propping up these technologies. So those type of considerations uh, are also important because it might not be that somebody used AI in a good way or a bad way that leads to a potential downfall. It could be that we prop up the technology uh, using the resources that are already scarce in certain places uh, or maybe are going to be scarce across the world. And even though the outcomes are probably not going to be that great, or even if they are great, if these resources are not left for more fundamental usage, I think that is also a type of a downfall. So I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm saying it's uh, another one of these conversations that needs to happen. Um, you know, behind the technology itself. Back to the school. Back well, here. back to the schoolhouse. Um, I, I think the regulation is always going to be a divisive conversation that'll probably end up falling on party lines. And there's always going to be, it'll be an ongoing one like net neutrality and various different conversations that unfold in this kind of kinetic culture that we're in right now. But what I do see emerging as a common theme is the importance of education, that we as a culture, we embrace the need for best practices, how AI is gonna be used across the board. Obviously, there is no arbiter of who's good or evil or who has the right to use it or not use it. It's gonna be used in any number of ways. And I think we all seem to agree that uh, the authors of humanity's demise will most likely be ourselves, um, unless we can adopt these tools in a synergistic way. So the education point just keeps emerging. And I think, uh, you know, one of the great examples that has happened recently is uh, some of these images that were spit out by the Gemini model. And because mm -hmm. there is an ongoing conversation about topics like that, because uh, we as a society are talking about these issues and are either educating or getting educated, uh, there was an immediate reaction to those type of things. So, uh, yeah, I'm not saying these kind of informal frameworks will always work you know, formal top-down regulation uh, is important, but the role of education, as Luca says, uh, uh, it will become even more important. How do we do that on a global level? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's important to remember that it's, I, we have a tendency to think of AI over here and humans over here, and I think sometimes we forget that ChatGPT is, is, for example, is a flow. So there's there's an ebb and flow, there's a, there's a continuum of ideas that are fed into it. People seem very concerned about about um, copyright and uh, you know patenting their own ideas and not putting it into the flow. But what if we flip that script and decided, oh no, we are engaging with the flow, so we put it. We want to put our ideas out there into it, and so we are training ChatGPT. So there's a so the humans are are part of a zeitgeist which informs the AI. So the information that's feeding back, it's not it's not a separation between us and them. We are one, so yeah, all of a sudden we get popes, you know, uh, popes of color, a female pope of color. Well, okay, that's not how humanity works. It's a shame, that'd be cool, but <laughs> you know, and why is it not work that way? Well, then it learns. Yeah. And Gemini's next ver iteration will learn better. Yeah. And just like Mesa's new promise is gonna blow ChatGPT out of the water, even though it's based on ChatGPT, but there's gonna be a constant evolution of this, of this to and fro in this conversation thought about it a minute ago, mentioned that, listened to a speech yesterday about now what happens when we look at regulation from a global standpoint? Who, who sets that stage? Well, there's no boundaries. I right. Mean, they're, they're, That's the concern. There's no borders. Right. And the gentleman brought it up yesterday is who's the number one out there right now? Japan. He was, it was great. He was in an airport and he said he's never seen so many cameras on people as he's ever seen before. Look at the right. <laughs> okay. So, you know, sometimes the simplest thing can be the most difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but who regulates that? There is none. Yeah. Okay. Who owns who after all of this? There is no way of guiding that. Um, a concern, major concern. Any thoughts on that from a global standpoint? I mean, Accenture? Yeah. I mean, we heard it yesterday from yeah. the panel as well, is that in North America, we're regulating ourselves. <laughs> but then the rest of the world isn't regulating themselves. Yeah, exactly. So then how do we make that work for right. us, right? If we're over-regulating and we're constantly worried about it, but yet the rest of the world isn't, then 
How do we resolve that? We're going to be buying from them. Yes. Right. <laughs> We're going to be buying from them. Yeah. You know, and that's not what we want. It isn't what we want. Obviously. So again, it comes back who's stating, who's setting the regulation and the standard. Who do we think should? Think about that. If it's on a global level, even from, you know, you go from the school to the corporation, both sides, I like that, is that where does it begin? Who sets that stage? We work with our clients hand in hand, just like you do right. with yours, right? We call it the white glove of service. We do not leave you alone. That's the way right? it should be, yes. And again, we have to understand the use cases. What use right. cases is our client trying to solve for right. that we have been hired to do? We are the experts. Right. We are the specialists. We have been the people, the entity, the company they've come to. Help me solve what I need to solve, right? So first, it's by listening. Understand the use cases right. or the use case they're solving for, right? And then we mesh that together. So again, back to Luca, it's not a separation. We need to work together. And I think when we work together, we're going to get, we're eventually going to become and evolve those answers. Now, there, is the rest of the world going to follow that? It's very possible because we work with clients across the globe. Yes, so right. do we. So if you do that and you, you set the stage, hopefully Correct. it sets the stage. Correct. And that is the hope, right? You go back to those companies that don't. And I don't, I don't know that's, it's, it's not unique to AI. It's not unique to, to the digital it business. Correct. It's not, it's in, it's in every business, but. So do they lose a competitive advantage by not adopting to these best practices? Eventually. Okay, so be it. So yeah, so, so right. It from a, from if you look at from a competitive angle, uh, you have ten companies in an in an industry, right. and uh, like you said, four or five companies, they're not they're not leveraging AI. They're not doing all the right things. They are selling the software to your clients, but you know one or two companies are doing the right things, mm -hmm. and then again, the clients have to come back and revisit everything, right? Um, so eventually, they'll be out of the business. How, mm -hmm. how long can you sustain that way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that becomes an issue for companies. I bought into something, I believed into it. Mm -hmm. It was gonna happen, we planned it, we put all of our resources into it, but we didn't buy the right product because we were sold, as people could say, a bill of goods. Yeah. So the market forces will determine Yes. A uh, lot of things that we are discussing. Right, right. So again, maybe teaching that at the school level is a good, a good start. Doesn't mean that everybody's going to be straight up and be honest when they get into the corporate world, because money plays into in the theater. Well, and that's that's why, yes, my, for 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 us, teaching lit, AI literacy is a means to an end that's actually has nothing to do with technology or AI. It has everything to do with leadership, which has everything to do with integrity. That's all we can hope for humanity, that we can navigate together and those, those who are trying to make the world a better place do so and, and rise, and those who are trying to yeah. contribute to its so, demise, may they, may they go away. But yeah, there's always long, gonna be those forces at play. As long as you can keep it at that, right? It's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. So, so you can use that to you know, reach whatever are your goals, right? quicker, faster, in a more efficient way. It also goes the other side, right? If you're going in the wrong direction, you can go there very fast. Yeah. So I again, think... it goes back to how do you, how do you, how do you uh, bring governance? How do you bring uh, checkpoints? How do you bring controls? It goes back to what you said. Well, I you think know, the, people uh, are the baseline. They are. It goes back to that. Yeah. So you, you mentioned a great point, market forces. Yeah. I think the 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 issue of looking at regulation from a global perspective itself is a very complex Correct. case. You know, and large scale problems uh, do not always require large scale solutions. They can have local solutions that work within a large scale framework. Market forces will provide that large scale framework, mm -hmm. just like they have provided. Not a hundred percent efficient, but they have provided in other areas of business even before AI. Um, you know, and within that, 
I think uh, a lot of countries will have to come up with their local uh, frameworks to suit their requirements as well. And it's also about how uh, the population or the professionals in a particular locale is perceiving AI. For example, this report came out from Exios, where uh, AI is considered to be uh, helping in productivity a lot more, and that is how it is pursued, a lot more in some of the developing countries as opposed to uh, in the West. So when these type of differences in perceptions are there, we do need to look uh, locally at some of these issues. And then the larger global framework is, as you mentioned, market forces, and also a momentum that is generated by uh, you know regulations like the one that EU uh, has laid out. I think that could be a source of inspiration. Uh, not to say that we copy paste it in uh, many different geographies, but to say, okay, now that this framework is out there, what parts of that might work in my country and what parts of that will not work? And yep. knowing that a lot of our business continues to be interconnected, uh, you know, globalization is not a force that has immediately died down, it is mm-hmm. still there. If you look at uh, some of the uh, tools like DHL connectedness ranking, uh, you know, it, it's still thriving. So that will automatically force a lot of organizations to fall in line with, uh, let's say, the common minimum program of mm-hmm. AI regulation. Mm-hmm. Just like GDPR, you know, people building tools for Europe in India, they have to be compliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, if they build a tool that is compliant for EU and is doing well in the market, maybe there is a chance for the tool to be incorporated in India in the same fashion mm-hmm. without making a whole lot of changes because that for them is going to be efficient. Mm-hmm. You know, have Makes sense. It's almost as if you said before, does the, <laughs> are, are we the only country that's regulating or slowing to that's think it. about regulation? Yeah. That's it. You know? Well, it's kind of like saying, are we the only democracy? Well, I mean, everyone everyone has a different interpretation of democracy and they all apply the same concept. Right. But there is no cookie cutter end result right. of how democracy unfolds. Right. Yeah. I and I do no like the regulation spin because, I mean, working globally, and you know this as well, Stephen, you have to go by that country's local regulation and standards. You better. So, exactly. <laughs> else you're paying some hefty fines and some other stuff. Daily. Right. So, again, that might be a, a place that we're also able to capitulate and start from and build, you know, when we're dealing with our cross-border, cross-global clients to look at their regulations and other frameworks they may have to adhere to to start building in some of that um, regulation to AI and how we use it as a tool. I'm not sure how much time we have left because I know we had some technical issues, but questions? I'd love to hear from you all. What are your thoughts about this? Are you Are you... Is regulation, do you see that as an issue within your business as you delve into AI? Have you looked at AI within your own companies? And what what has your experience been so far? Please. Do you have Mike? Do you need? No, I need Okay. Okay. regards to regulations, and the, uh, the yesterday's panel that you referred to, where I asked the same question, was, uh, you know, we are seeing regulations in this country, and then someone made a remark, well, China isn't regulated, no. mm. so are they going to get ahead of us? So in my view, it's not so much who gets ahead at this moment, it's really about what's the mindset behind using AI. So it, it's a both ones. <laughs> questions that you raised, that productivity gains are probably being seen in India more than in the U.S., just making it up. It's true. But there is, there is a growth mindset which is driving, which is saying, we want to do more. Mm-hmm. So AI is looked upon as a means to that end. Correct. So in a global sense, we started looking at different regulatory frameworks and trying to map it to the mindset. Where is this coming from? Where is the European Union's regulation coming from? What is the motivation behind it? And so that might help figure out where where the regulation 
organizations uh, and mm -hmm. uh, what the impact is within the boundaries of the country or if you want to do business there. So I was going to ask if that made sense. No, no, it does. And I mean, I'll tell it you, does make sense. Yes. It, it, it does make sense. It yeah. makes perfect sense. And I'll tell you, it does, is that what we're doing is that as we work globally, okay, we have set up, we have separate agreements with companies globally. I mean, they've been they've been looked at by attorneys to make sure our attorneys and everything we're doing has to go with each country, mm -hmm. each region within each country. I still go back to that question: Who's regulating? <laughs> that that's a problem. Okay, and and if you say that you know there's the, you, you think well I'll, I'll just do it now and I'll get away with it. Yeah, they can. I mean, I was in digital outdoor. Okay, I worked for CBS Network. And one of the things that some of the major cities put together is when it comes to digital out there, now where's that regulation? And if you do things on certain buildings, the city said, well, we're going to sue you. Know what the, uh, the company said? Okay. Want to know why? Because I'm making so much money each month, I don't care what you sue me for. All right. So you were saying. Yeah, exactly. You know, accumulating so many cash piles. Uh, but I like the way you phrased it about no, it's a good point. growth mindset. Right. Yep. You know, a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And you could almost imagine it on a little two by two where, you know, different parties interacting with each other. Yeah. Uh, is the government approaching it from a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset mm -hmm. uh, versus the organizations that are developing AI who are probably generally thinking about it from a growth mindset and different quadrants will lead to different types of regulatory uh, requirements or innovations. Uh, at least that is the thing. I think uh, in general, I would presume that uh, approaching the use of AI from a growth mindset is useful in determining where uh, the regulations are uh, or how the regulations are going to come up. It's a bit like the game of Minesweeper that used to be there on the old machines. <laughs> uh, unless you, you know, sure. go on selecting things, you're not going to be able to identify mm -hmm. where are some of those mines, and there are going to be failures, like. Uh, the failures that have happened with other technologies. But unless we use it in the right type of fashion with the right type of speed, let's say, uh, we are probably always either going to overstate the risks or understate the risks. The only way to find out is kind of, you know, deploying the tools. Uh, and uh, as I uh, firmly believe, you know, innovate on the regulatory side uh, at the same speed with which the apps are or, you know, the tools are uh, also coming up. I love the, 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 the question and bringing the, the notion of mindset into how we're using AI and, you know, echoing the, the fixed versus growth mindset. That's something that, you know, I, as far as how to keep it as simple as possible with our students, what we've been exp experimenting with and teaching is the prove versus improve mindset. Uh, so are you using AI to prove that you know something you don't actually know, that you did research that you didn't actually do, that you are going to make a great speech and that you're going to do this, that, and the other? Or are you using it as a, as a vehicle to improve? Improve systems, improve mindset, improve my knowledge, and help me learn in a better way because I, I have uh, cognitive differences. I might need my own tailored approaches. Improve versus prove, and that's, uh, I find that very helpful. Now, that's not necessarily on the regulatory level, and be great if it were, but but on the educational level, perhaps. Do you find too? What about ethical concerns? Ethical concerns. No, no, intent and you know. Uh, so it, I I agree with you on the intent, right? So again, you said the regulation is also based on the intent, right? Mm -hmm. So are you playing to win? Or are you playing not to lose? So that, that, that can change everything, right? So, yeah. No. Yeah. 
Well, the outcome is, is exciting because finally we're having conversations of ethics with our students, which we otherwise wouldn't be having. Sure. Uh, we start with teaching AI at face value. So we talk about the fundamentals, the applications, the challenges, and the ethics of AI. So suddenly we're having heated debates with students around what are the ethics of this? Now we're talking about consciousness. What is consciousness? What is sentience? These are great conversations to be having. I'm getting that signal. So I appreciate great questions. Uh, we're here. We'd love to talk to you more about that. And uh, we thank you for coming and listening to us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Hey, thank you, everyone. One more time for our panelists, that was great. <laughs>